All right, so today we are going to talk about Emily Dickinson. So I want to start with the definition of perspective. Perspective is the unique way that you see the world around you. It has a Latin root that means to look through. And in fact, every definition that we have of this word perspective has something to do with sight. And sight becomes a major theme throughout Emily Dickinson's poetry. She's a little obsessed with sight. She was scared that her eyes were going bad. She has a poem about losing an eye. There are themes in her poetry about the way that she experiences the world and sees things. So we're going to keep that in mind as we move forward. And you can tell um, in the word perspective, this right here, spec. That's in other words that are pretty similar, like spectator or spectacular, spectacle. Okay, so here's a quote from the book about how Emily Dickinson has been mythologized in popular culture. Quote, she was first publicized in almost mythic terms as a reclusive, eccentric, death-obsessed spinster who wrote in fits and starts as the spirit moved her. So this quote, um, it embodies what people generally think about Emily Dickinson, that she was this crazy lady who just stayed inside of her house, that she was obsessed with morbid topics like death, isolation, and loneliness, and that she was a weirdo. And in fact, um, it's not just the way that history has remembered her, but during her own time, the locals in Massachusetts also thought this about her. They're like, who is that weird girl? Why is she always just wearing white? Does she think that she is haunting a house? What's going on there? And of course, there's some truth to these things. She does write about death and she was unmarried and she was a recluse, but her reality, of course, is more complex than that. So let's learn a little bit about who she was. Who was she really? Uh, she came from a prominent family of intellects in Massachusetts. She was a middle child. She had an older brother and a younger sister. She was born with a gifted mind that's evident in the work that she has produced. It's very creative. It explores. It is playful. And it is, in some cases, it seems a little, I don't want to say silly, it seems very playful, but the subject matter is serious. So she has this incredibly gifted mind. She was unmarried and she lived at home with her sister. Incredibly common for unmarried women to still live at home. She was educated. She attended Amherst Academy whenever she was a kid. And for most accounts, it seems like she was a good, curious student, loved to learn, and she has been quoted as saying that she loved her teachers. And then as a teenager, she goes to a religious school and there she really felt like, um, like an odd duck, right? Like she did not really, her beliefs did not meld with what she was being taught at that school. It was very much at odds. And then toward the end of her life, she experienced a great deal of loss and she also became ill. She was a voluntary recluse. So, you know, we did not choose to become recluses in quarantine. It takes a special kind of person to choose to become a recluse, and she is that type of person. And we're not sure if this was because she wanted to write so many poems because they did find an abundance of poetry that she had written and not published after her death, but, um, it could be because she was writing, it could be because she was ill, it could be because of her grief over all of this loss that she experienced. Who knows? She had a penchant for wearing white clothing, and the color white held a significance to Emily Dickinson. And 
in some ways, the way that she interpreted that color is very different from what most people, I don't want to say most people, most Western audiences might associate with the color white. We kind of associate it with this purity and this innocence. Um, but for Emily Dickinson, it was the color of white hot passion. So she might look very modest and very angelic or ghostly in that white dress, but to her, it means something completely different. And I think it's important to remember when we are talking about these authors that yes, in many cases like this one, they are incredibly gifted and sometimes even a bit strange, but they were also people who had real lives and real relationships that affected them. She was a daughter, a sister. She had lovers, multiple. The book even suggests that she was bisexual. She was a friend. We know this from the many letters that she wrote. And she was a trailblazer of the poetic form. She experimented a lot with punctuation, capitalization. She loved dashes. So if we look at the poetry that um, I selected in our online textbook, you will see those dashes all over the place. She also fancied a slant rhyme, right? She liked slant rhymes that was not super conventional. Uh, also, so like in our textbook, I put titles for her poems. It's just the first line of each poem. Emily Dickinson did not title her poems. They have numbers. They don't have titles. So just for ease of you um, completing the assignments, I put titles there that are the first line of the poem. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I don't know. Too late to go back now. But she did not title her poetry, which is interesting. It, the effect of reading something without a title is different. We expect a title to give us a taste of what the poem is going to be about. When that title's absent, it's almost like we are invited, or not really invited, we are pushed into reading the poem. Right? We don't get that taste. If we want to know what it's about, we have to open that door and we have to walk in. And it also might make it seem more private. There's different ways you can interpret that, different ways that that might make you feel, but I do think it's significant. And publishers at the time really wanted to change her poetry to make it more conventional. So publishers either were not interested in her or they were interested in her and they saw her her many gifts, but they wanted to make her poetry more palatable for audiences. And so they heavily edited it. And she hated this. She called it surgery. So this was something that, um, you know, think about it. You, you devote your life to creating these beautiful poems they're exactly how you want them. And poets are very careful with the words that they choose and the punctuation that they choose. Form is extremely important in poetry and affects the way you read and feel. So imagine if you created something, a dance, you wrote a song, um, you did a painting, and then somebody comes back with a paintbrush and they say, oh, you know, this looks great. I, I really like your work here, but if I could just, and then they dip their paintbrush in paint and then they go and they paint over the little things that they don't like and they change it to make it more conventional. If you think about how that felt, right, that probably felt like crap. So here are discussion questions I have for Emily Dickinson. Well, for y'all over Emily Dickinson, it's not like she's going to come back from the grave and answer these, although I would love it if she did. So the first one says, although modern readers consider Dickinson's poetic form innovative and creative, her contemporaries were not always so kind. Many thought her style was rebellious or even reckless and unsophisticated because it lacked the conventions commonly associated with classic literature. 
For example, Dickinson uses those dashes frequently in her poetry, even ending lines with them instead of using like a period, a question mark, or an exclamation point. So what you're going to do is choose a line from Dickinson's poetry that ends with a dash. It could be in the middle of the poem, be at the end of the poem, I don't care where it is, a line that ends with the dash. And then you can also choose it from the textbook that I created, but if you find a Dickinson poem you would rather talk about, that's okay too. And I want you to ask yourself, how does that dash affect your reading of the line? How does it change it? How do you feel with that dash at the end instead of a period or a question mark, what we would typically expect at the end? Think about how the meaning of that line would change if there was not a dash there, if there was maybe one of those other marks there. What does that dash do to the meaning? And then is there anything else in the poem that stands out to you as unusual? That's the first one. Second discussion question. So in a lot of ways, Emily Dickinson was like an original sad girl. Like Lana Del Rey would be nothing without Emily Dickinson. Like, right, like Emily Dickinson, she invented sad. You know, we talk about a lot of artists now that have this melancholic tone and stuff like that. Emily Dickinson has a very similar writing aesthetic. So this discussion question has a little bit to do with that. It says Dickinson attended a religious school when she was about your age. According to our book, quote, students were regularly queried as to whether they professed faith, had hope, or were resigned to no hope. Dickinson remained adamantly among the small group of no hopes. Arguably, her assertion of no hope was a matter of defiance, a refusal to capitulate to the demands of orthodoxy. A year after leaving Mount Holyoke, Dickinson, in a letter to a friend, described her failure to convert with darkly comic glee. I am one of the lingering bad ones, end quote. Select one of Dickinson's poems and analyze whether or not she remains a no hope and then use text evidence. So what I mean by this, when, when you're young, you have certain ideas, certain attitudes, you may be grappling with your beliefs because it is only in our nature as we are children to listen to our parents and the things that have been told to us. They say Santa Claus is real. And so you believe in Santa, but then one day, you find out from your big brother or from a friend at school that Santa is not real. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, now I have to grapple with my beliefs. What else have they been lying to me about? It's like a rite of passage. So a lot of teenagers, they struggle when they grow up in a particular faith or they grow up around a belief set that everybody else seems, it seems like it's so easy for them to fall in line. And so they end up feeling weird because they cannot bring themselves to believe the same things now that they have this new information or they are just having doubts that has affected them a certain way. And Emily Dickinson, it seems like she felt kind of odd at her school and with her peers and that she was maybe a little bit proud of that. And a lot of her poetry does focus on topics that pertain to this idea of hope. And so I want you to isolate one of her poems and you tell me if the ideas expressed in that poem align more with somebody who has some kind of faith, has some kind of hope, or is just completely hopeless. I think it's interesting to think about because sometimes as we grow up, our beliefs change, but some things don't. So we'll see what you come up with.
Okay, the last one. So this one is asking you to practice turning inward. Of course, Emily Dickinson is our famous recluse. So this kind of has to do with that. Choose one of the poems from our textbook and consider its meaning. Right, simple enough. What symbols, motifs, concepts, and images does the poet seem to be focusing on? Next, take a moment and turn your thoughts inward to you, the reader. What questions do you have while reading this poem? What did it feel like reading this poem? And finally, I want you to make a thoughtful, personal connection to this poem in some way. With this one, I think it's an interesting practice to try with literature to not only notice what we think the poet is trying to express, but to notice our own thoughts and feelings as well and get a little introspective. Remember that word at the beginning of this lesson was perspective. And your perspective affects the way that you read something. So this discussion question is asking you to pay attention to that. All of your answers to the discussion questions should be about a paragraph's length. I'm not asking for one page essays, but I am asking that your answers are thoughtful, that you have answered it completely. It should be more than just a few sentences. And make sure that you are using academic language. Of course, we are in a college course, so we need to be in practice of that. And then um, you only have to choose two of the discussion questions. You do not have to do all three. Just pick the two that you like and go there. Okay, that's all that I have for right now. Have a wonderful day.